Prime Minister, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I cannot express uh, the pleasure that it gives to me to introduce my old friend Mario Monti to you today. We've had an overwhelming response in terms of the number of applicants to be here with us today. And those of us who believe in Europe can say with some certainty that in the pantheon of European heroes, Mario Monti will certainly figure as one of them. And there aren't too many around. <clears throat> His commitment to his country and to Europe has been evidenced clearly by the position which he has taken, and even more obviously by the courageous steps that have taken place since he took up his position. His long period as a commissioner was distinguished by his integrity, by the force of his character, by the intelligence of his application, and by his clear understanding of the institutional development of the European Union, in which he believes so strongly. And to have Italy playing a role of leadership in Europe from the point of view of integration is something that is greatly welcomed by all of us. But time is short, much though I would like to speak at far greater length about our guest today. I'm going to ask him to come to the lectern to speak to you, and then we will take Q&A from the audience, not from the press today, because there have been press conferences, and we hope that we will have a good discussion. But I conclude where I began. This is an enormous pleasure. It's also a great privilege to welcome my own friend, Mario Monti. It's rare uh, to feel uh, uncontainable emotion, but I do. Uh, the emotion of being uh, at uh, the LSE, of being in this theater not entirely empty, <laughs> to be introduced by my old friend Peter Sutherland and to be introduced through those words. And uh, as many of you will know, and I want each of you to know, uh, Peter has been my a role model when I was Commissioner of the European Union and in particular Competition Commissioner, a function that he brought to uh, unparalleled uh, levels of uh, influence in Europe and elsewhere. And uh, I am uh, really um, full of emotion in uh, uh, taking the floor here after his introductory uh, remarks. Um, I am also very aware of the fact that maybe one or two among you are Italians. <laughs> and uh, um, maybe are following with uh, interest, if not passion, the developments in Italy. And I uh, want to assure you all that I feel that uh, the talented Italians that uh, are studying or teaching at uh, universities, particularly such a prominent university as the LSC, I never considered <coughs> brains that uh, were uh, drawn out of Italy. I hope that uh, we will, to some extent, through uh, my government's action, facilitate uh, uh, the circulation of best brains in and out. But I 
uh, I really am a morphant. <laughs> I, I really would like to work. This will be a long uh, uh, task. We can only do the beginning in our time-limited uh, efforts. Uh, work uh, for uh, young Italians and brilliant Italians and motivated Italians uh, to feel Italian and also to feel part of uh, a, a system of which we have to be proud uh, wherever we work. So, and, and I'm delighted, uh, and I ap apologize for those of you who are not Italian for this uh, a bit uh, provincial accent, but uh, I love uh, European and worldwide integration precisely because it can allow us some forms of provincialism without becoming uh, dangerous. <laughs> The topic that I intended to touch upon was EU in a global economy, a challenge for growth. Uh, I hope to say a few things not entirely unrelated with this topic, uh, but please uh, don't expect from me the uh, attempt uh, um, of being uh, even remotely systematic as I would have felt uh, compelled to be had I been a professor. Uh, the uh, European Union in a global economy, I think the European Union is at a juncture where uh, it uh, has the greatest uh, potential it ever had to be beneficial to the world and influential in the world whilst uh, probably is at a very weak point in terms of the capacity to exercise that influence. The potential is, I think, unparalleled in the past uh, for two reasons at least. Um, after the uh, financial crisis, should I say after the beginning of, an, of the financial crisis, or I hope that we soon will be able to say after the financial crisis, uh, the European Union, in my view, has seen uh, at least two of its uh, features more appreciated uh, uh, by others in the world than it was the case before the financial crisis. One is an internal feature, that is the attention paid uh, in Europe in different ways uh, with various national variations to the social aspects of the social market economy. So, so to the interconnection between economy and society. Um, and uh, I think that a few institutions could embody that uh, uh, relationship as well as the London School of Economics and Political Science does. Uh, and uh, uh, whereas the social attentions uh, uh, given by Europe to these aspects were a bit uh, um, taken with uh, smiles in the US, say, or China before the financial crisis, we have seen with and after the financial and then economic and then social crisis uh, a much higher degree of respect both from the US and China, to take just two hugely important countries towards the social aspects of the uh, European economic models, I should speak in the plural. And of course we are aware and we should be more and more aware of the fact that if we want to be able to sustainably uh, bring ahead those uh, attentions to the social, we need to put our economic much more uh, straight and to vastly improve it in order to be sufficiently competitive as to afford a continuity in a reformed spirit through reformed institutions of our social attentions. And the other aspect which is to me uh, even more important is that the financial crisis has generated a demand for global governance, have 
has given more concreteness rather to such a demand, has shown the urgency of it, and the proof of that is the new impetus on the G something processes, uh, and including the G20, of course, in particular. And it was in the UK that after the financial crisis, the G20 uh, got its first uh, big uh, momentum. Uh, but uh, is this not uh, a belated, partial and unsystematic recognition of the need of uh, a multilateral governance of integration processes, just as Jean Monnet had uh, seen clearly many, many decades before? Because uh, what uh, did it take in order to put in place a very successful globalization albeit uh, confined uh, to the limits of the European space, as the European Union has been for 50 or 60 years. Well, it took two things associated with each other, uh, a, a destruction and a creation. The destruction, uh, not in the sense of Schumpeter in this case, but uh, the destruction of uh, uh, barriers, of uh, restrictions, of border lines, so the creation of integrated markets, if you want, but at the same time the creation of uh, at least a minimum of public policy coordination, if not, in certain areas, a fully-fledged common policy, as has been the case for two subjects since the very beginning in the European Union, uh, trade and uh, uh, competition, and our host this evening was uh, eminent in both and is eminent in the advocacy uh, still of both. Uh, and then much, much later, monetary policy, the third uh, single policy of the European Union. Uh, and uh, uh, I think the efforts done with variable degree within the G20 context uh, uh, of pushing forward elements of a global governance uh, are a remote uh, copy of what the European Union was able to put in place. Um, is it not a pity then that the potential provider of uh, the widest uh, uh, supply of expertise of this kind of exercise, which is the European Union, risks being undermined in its effective ability to display this, to bring this to the rest of the world because of internal inadequacies of governance. I think it's a great pity uh, for the projection of European ideals across the world and also for the uh, uh, gradual contraction of the economic impact of the European Union through insufficient competitiveness. But uh, this is just to say that uh, we should be proud, I believe, of being uh, those of us uh, uh, who are members of the European Union, and, uh, uh, and we have a duty vis-à-vis -vis the rest uh, uh, of us in order to cooperate with our experience without any presumption. We have so many elements of weakness towards global governance. Um, the uh, inadequacies of governance uh, uh, within the European Union, which risk undermining the operation of exporting our model successfully across the world when it is demanded, uh, have to do in part with the governance of the EU as a whole, in part, in a more accentuated manner in recent times, with inadequacies in the governance of the Eurozone more specifically. And it is uh, uh, interesting to see how much the second sort of weaknesses, those concerning the governance of the European Union, um, uh, occupy the minds uh, uh, also of those um, uh, persons and institutions and governments which are not part of the Eurozone. Much of my discussion today with Prime Minister Cameron was indeed on what needs to be done urgently in order to enhance the quality of governance of the Eurozone. This is not a topic to which uh, the UK uh, is insensitive, of course. 
Um, I uh, think that uh, we are almost there in putting in place uh, what I believe is the definitive, definitive not in the sense that then it can be shelved, but in the sense that then it has to be implemented consistently, the definitive step in uh, uh, in the area of fiscal discipline through the constitutionalization of uh, the so-called fiscal compact, which we hope will be the object of a political agreement uh, on the 30th of January in the European Council, to be then formally signed by the heads of states and governments on the 1st of March at another European Council. I think it will be important for that final piece of the puzzle of uh, discipline to be in place uh, so that uh, uh, we, we would uh, all simply have to respect it rather than uh, being over concerned about uh, the future possibility that somebody might not respect it, uh, thus enhancing month after month, year, uh, year after year, the uh, proofs to be given uh, for the purity of a disciplined, uh, disciplined mind by a, a member state. I think we will have that in place, uh, that uh, will be necessary to be observed, and I think that piece uh, in place will allow all the concerned parties to be more relaxed in the handling of their respective policy responsibilities from the ECB, the European Central Bank, um, around which I remember with pleasure the agreement uh, that uh, Chancellor Merkel, President Sarkozy and I uh, made at um, the, the first in recent times trilateral meeting we had in Strasbourg in November as soon as I was uh, in office, that is to surround the ECB of a respectful and symmetrical silence with uh, uh, each government respecting the need of not asking the ECB to do something and not asking the ECB not to do something. This uh, is creative of the most appropriate uh, policy environment for unconstrained, independent and, I'm sure, wise decisions. And equally, all the other institutions, I think, will feel more uh, relaxed in putting on the agenda, finally, uh, issues that are not less important than fiscal discipline if we want to have our beloved uh, social market economy in Europe characterized by growth, by job creation, by welfare in our societies. And this brings us to growth policies. I will not develop the topic in any, in any uh, depth, um, but uh, let me uh, just say that I believe that here in particular, uh, the UK and uh, the Eurozone have uh, hugely common interests. From this point of view, I as an Italian, I as a representative of the Italian government would like to see uh, the UK as deeply immersed in the inner core of decision making in uh, Europe because I happen to believe that the values of an open economy, an open market, competition, uh, respect for the law which is unevenly distributed across Europe uh, and other features that uh, the UK normally brings with it uh, are powerful ingredient for the construction of more uh, growth-oriented policies in Europe. It is for this reason that I had very much hoped uh, in the days before the 8th of December uh, in talks with uh, the British Prime Minister that he could be persuaded to, yes, uh, extract uh, a compensation from an acceptance of a new treaty on fiscal discipline uh, so that he could be fully on board, but uh, uh, a compensation that uh, would be progressive in terms of bringing European integration forward not 
uh, regressive in uh, putting a break on further European integration. Uh, I know all the, complex, uh, the complexities of, uh, of uh, the domestic uh, uh, political landscape in this country. Uh, each of us has a domestic political landscape. I'm even uh, uh, trying to understand our own domestic political landscape. Um, because uh, if one is a, uh, is a non-political entity, it is nevertheless uh, not allowed to neglect the complexities of the landscape from which the approval or lack of approval of measures in the Parliament uh, ultimately depends. Uh, and, uh, uh, but, but I think it would have been great to have the UK fully on board, insisting, for example, on having in the fiscal compact agreement, yes, measures to strengthen the enforcement of fiscal discipline, but also in parallel, equally binding measures in order to uh, increase the enforcement of single market rules, which are the, often the Cinderella in the enforcement of uh, rules by the European Commission because uh, in the area of the single market, the Commission lacks the very effective and prompt powers that it has in the area that was ours of competition policy. So, uh, the, the opportunity of being all together on, in that treaty is gone, I, I'm afraid, but uh, uh, I think it would be very important to use the next European Council or Councils to come to some concrete uh, uh, operational uh, enforceable solution to give more um, impetus to the single market as a factor for uh, growth. Also because, as uh, Peter Sutherland and I had many opportunities to discuss in recent years, uh, if, uh, if there is not uh, a much greater commitment to bring economic integration further in Europe, the forces are there that could uh, bring us backwards because in many of our countries there are uh, nationalistic trends, there are factors of disintegration. The case uh, for those uh, advocating uh, um, the market and competition has become more difficult after the, uh, the financial crisis. And we see how, for example, a formerly integrated uh, um, EU banking system is disintegrating when in the management of the crisis the different uh, national supervisory authorities uh, uh, follow uh, a national uh, logic. Now, I think, Mr. Chairman, I will uh, stop here. Um, I uh, have not uh, given you for sure any original thought, but maybe some uh, elements for reflection on uh, the fact uh, that uh, the challenges for growth of the EU in the global economy, I see now the title of what I should have been saying to you, uh, is, really, is really in our hands. And to conclude with a note on, on Italy, as I did at the beginning, uh, I think uh, uh, it's uh, a crucial commitment uh, on the part of Italy now and specifically of my government and we have several ministers uh, here with me today uh, that uh, Italy um, quickly be removed from the list uh, entitled sources of problems in the Eurozone and shifted into the list of the proactive contributors to the solutions. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Prime Minister. And now we are going to open for questions. I would like to make two points. First of all, anybody who wishes to ask a question, raise their hand, and when we come to you, please state your name and affiliation. Um, secondly, <clears throat> as I said at the outset, this will be left to members of the audience. The Prime Minister has already had press conferences, 
and we want to engage as many as possible of the small group who have been able to get in out of, out of the huge number that tried to get in. So um, uh, could I first of all ask people who wish to speak, not all at the same time, to raise their hands. And um, I have three here, uh, all eminent. May I have uh, this gentleman here, Mr. Grant? I would ask everybody, and this isn't directed at you, uh, ask everybody to keep their questions as short as possible. Charles Grant from the Centre for European Reform. Uh, Mario, you didn't say very much about Germany, but you've had a lot of meetings with German leaders recently, Wait, and many of us believe that your own excellent efforts in Italy <clears throat> are not likely to succeed in the long run without more flexibility on policy from the Germans. From your meetings with the Germans, do you think they are realizing that their existing policies and proposals of the EU are not solving the problems? Are they becoming more flexible? Are there rays of hope in Berlin uh, and indeed in Frankfurt? Anthony. Um, Tony Giddens, previous director of the LSE, I'd like to welcome you back. And I remember many occasions when we met here before. My question is short. Uh, what is the relationship, in your view, between austerity and growth? Short question. Um, <laughs> whether the answer will be short, um, even with Mario, is the next question. Um, yes, this gentleman here, please. Good evening, uh, Prime Minister. Andrea Mandelmantello, Roman, not Italian, but uh, investor in Italy through Advicorp PLC, which I am um, a chief executive of, and also a uh, founding member of Italian Angels for Growth, the first angel investor group in Italy. Um, to grow, a country needs new companies, new enterprise. Um, to do so, you need to create the conditions for that to happen. What measures do you intend to take to encourage entrepreneurs to invest in Italy and to create new companies or new employment? Could I ask you, Mario, to take those three questions? And we'll move on then. <coughs> From here. Yeah, yeah. From here. Yeah, to, to Charles Grant. Uh, um, yes, uh, we are having a close relationship uh, with the German uh, government and with uh, the Chancellor. Uh, the, uh, well, I think I made uh, uh, the point uh, uh, rather explicit that uh, the uh, sustainability of uh, efforts, of deep efforts by Italy and concentrated in time for us to uh, get a solid uh, budgetary consolidation and growth through the removal of structural constraints to growth um, is uh, uh, going to be uh, very difficult in its sustainability through the months and in the delivery of the expected results uh, unless uh, there is uh, not, uh, uh, unless there is, sorry, unless there is uh, some uh, return. This, I'm glad of your question, Charles, so that I can clarify that uh, I, I, we, we never imagined or imagine now that uh, the uh, return should be uh, money from any particular member state, uh, nor any uh, exemption or exception to the framework of discipline, uh, nothing at all, no, no concessions at all. We, we don't want and we don't need concessions. Uh, what uh, we need, just as uh, I think all uh, members of the Eurozone do, and of course, the need is the higher, the higher the inherited stock of debt of a country relative to its GDP. Uh, what we need is a sufficiently effective governance system of the Eurozone that is able to eliminate the particular risk that now markets associate with the Eurozone. 
uh, in terms of the much observed spread between the uh, Italy's Treasury bonds and the German Bund, um, we, uh, for example, saw that uh, a peak uh, was reached, uh, I'm sure by coincidence, uh, the day I was called by the President of the Republic to go to Rome, uh, uh, November the 9th. Uh, actually, he picked me in Berlin. Isn't this symbolic? I was there for a conference. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and, uh, uh, the, and afterwards, until uh, uh, the, the uh, 7, I think, of December, the spread came down nicely and everybody was encouraged in Italy. Then, more or less at the time we put out our first bunch of measures uh, in those days, the spread came up again, uh, obviously looking at the comments on the measures, not because they were not uh, considered uh, uh, good measures, uh, but uh, because then came the result, the disappointing result of the European Council of the 8th of, uh, uh, of December. And so uh, this is, I think, the, 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 the living proof of the fact that, that uh, if one does its homework, which was badly needed, is far from finished and will have to continue, uh, uh, it, that is not sufficient in this, in the present policy environment for a country to be able to reap the benefit, not the transfers from anybody else in terms of lower interest rates. Of course, this has huge, uh, hugely negative economic and political implications because politically many people said, okay, here we have a, a technical government made uh, up of very decent people, widely respected in Europe. What has changed in terms of the spread? Once it went down a bit, but then came up again. Uh, so this obviously presents the country with a problem of comprehension, but also in terms of economic effects, uh, uh, it's uh, not really conducive to growth if uh, uh, a treasury at the present interest rates, uh, real interest or nominal interest rates, sorry, at the present rate of growth uh, has to pay 7% on 10 years bond. Uh, so, uh, but, but all this in my view requires uh, a better governance of, of, the, of the Eurozone. And of course, Germany is one of the key interlocutors, if not uh, the, the most uh, key interlocutor for this. But uh, this should not be confused in any uh, way with, uh, uh, the, with, with a transfer union, for example. And, uh, but, I, but I'm rather optimistic now. I see different uh, pieces uh, coming together, which uh, lead me to believe that uh, uh, we will have some uh, uh, silent, uh, quiet, I hope quiet, um, coming together of different pieces without uh, much uh, uh, triumphalistic uh, declarations, uh, which might allow us even to breathe a bit. Um, Anthony Giddens, uh, austerity and growth. Uh, uh, the answer is, of course, very short. I gave already a part of it, mentioning how growth uh, um, has to come up for austerity to be sustainable, in a sense. <laughs> but even I, I think what is interesting, interesting, and here in London you can measure that better than anybody else. Uh, that more and more the uh, assessment of the markets and of the rating agencies uh, um, on, uh, on countries uh, is uh, related, yes, to good public finance and the and good public finance, but also to growth, uh, because our societies demand more growth now that it isn't there and also because to make uh, the uh, improvements in, uh, in the budgetary situation for any country sustainable in the long term, well, uh, it doesn't uh, harm if the denominator moves up, moves up a bit, that is GDP, that is uh, growth. Uh, of course, coming the question about austerity and growth uh, from 
the professor from which it came. Uh, I should uh, refer to many of his uh, uh, works uh, and uh, political models derived uh, from uh, them. Uh, Italian Angels for Growth, uh, well, I would uh, um, invite uh, and, and, and uh, pray Italian Angels to, to take a very active look uh, at uh, the country which gives them the name uh, in, in, in these days, not only for growth, but more generally, we need uh, um, many angels uh, uh, over, uh, overseeing uh, our uh, activities. Uh, and I'm sure that if you are there, growth will come. But we, we, we help uh, uh, the activities of angels by, for example, uh, Introducing, I believe it will be Article 1 of Decree Law. Uh, uh, today is the 18th. De Decree Law 20 January 2012 that we will adopt on, on Friday. Uh, Article 1 will uh, uh, deal with the, the huge simplification and reduction of cost. Uh, uh, where is the, the angel? Uh, yes. And, and, uh, uh, and the reduction of, of cost uh, in, in setting up a new, a new company, plus many other simplification matters. But uh, you will tell us if we do enough. Please do. <clears throat> now, I chose the wrong people because they asked two good questions. Have anybody, has anybody got uh, a bad question, a short question? <laughs> yes, here, please. And then I'll move up there. <clears throat> Thank you, Andrew Kahn. I was a uh, member of Lord Cofield's cabinet that helped to create the single market uh, and subsequently Neil kinnock Schefter cabinet. And you were uh, Prime Minister a hero not only to your fellow commissioners but to many officials also in the commission. My question is this. Um, uh, when the chairman of the uh, Chinese uh, Sovereign Wealth Fund was asked would he invest in Europe, his reply was, why would I want to invest? in a series of welfare states which have two generous, uh, generous entitlements and where the, uh, uh, the workers don't work. Now, that's a rather aggressive line, but I wondered whether how you see uh, the European Union's relationship with China, the competitive threat of China, and how we change uh, uh, the so Chinese Sovereign Wealth Fund's view uh, of, our, uh, uh, of our economies. You will not be surprised that that question was raised by an eminent member of Lord Cofield's cabinet. But we'll say no more about that. Can we have this? Yes, Mr. Palmer. John Palmer. John Palmer. Um, Prime Minister, um, you referred in the past to a future <coughs> happy rendezvous when uh, the governance of the union uh, is satisfactorily structured and a number of new initiatives might become possible. Uh, and I think in that context you referred to the possibility of redeployment of Eurobonds. My question is, do you see an advantage to the deployment of Eurobonds to support an investment-led recovery in Europe, as opposed to assisting uh, sovereign debt? <coughs> this person in the first front row over here. Hi, Nicola Mastorocco, PhD student here and Italian citizen also. It's a, a, an honor to be here standing in front of you. I'm here. <laughs> here, here. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> okay, my question is uh, still related to European governance. And, so, and it's related to the recent uh, standard and poor downgrades. Uh, so you commented, uh, in that relation they pointed out that one of the main reasons for the downgrade was the poor economic governance and mismanagement of the crisis. And you commented in a sort of mood of understanding uh, the question saying that uh, it's true we need um, more effort in place. Uh, um, and, but yet I see this effort uh, and, and in, because there are uh, the table is open for bargaining. Uh, you're meeting uh, prime minister of every of other countries uh, on a monthly basis. Uh, so my question is, and yet we've been downgraded. So uh, how much do you think uh, uh, the private sector rating agency insisting 
for a better governance in this way are actually uh, ob obtaining the opposite, so harming the uh, possibility of uh, uh, achieving this. Would you like to take Thanks. Those? That's fine. Would you like to answer those? Yes, I feel the moral compulsion to begin from uh, uh, the downgrading and uh, therefore from, from the rating agency. Um, it's, it's not good to be in the B class. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I was nevertheless relieved in, uh, in seeing that much of the downgrading, at least as a moral consolation, that uh, much of the downgrading of Italy was due to the uh, negative evaluation on the Eurozone governance, plus, of course, Italian factors that uh, can be changed only in the longer run. Um, I see your point. Uh, by downgrading uh, Eurozone member states uh, because of poor Eurozone governance, uh, the rating agencies make the improvement of that Euro governance uh, even more difficult. Probably the the total derivative of the quality of Euro governance uh, uh, relative to the uh, uh, rating agencies evaluation of it is uh, the sum of two partial derivatives. Uh, one is the objective making the situation more difficult, uh, and that is with a plus, but I think there is also a partly uh, offsetting factor because the precipitation, especially in the case of this, uh, I, ha I hadn't thought that we could in fact uh, speak of, uh, of uh, how is it, breed, uh, breed behavior. Uh, also by the rating agencies uh, and also uh, concerning the countries uh, affected now, uh, several of them. This uh, does create a feeling among, uh, I think, the governments that uh, something needs to be done uh, urgently. Uh, my, my attitude on the rating agencies uh, is obviously very cautious. Um, I think uh, mm, as Mario Draghi said in the European Parliament, I thought, I think it was yesterday, that uh, one thing to look at very carefully is uh, uh, the state of competition in the market of, uh, of ratings. Uh, and uh, it may be the case, uh, but this is a reminiscence of past uh, uh, readings, uh, that uh, particularly in the US, uh, some aspects of public regulation uh, helped keep very low the number of uh, rating agencies. This would not be the first case when public re uh, regulation has unintended uh, side effects which are negative for competition. But I think uh, th there is uh, something to be done there. I think they do a terribly difficult job. It's, it's uh, easier to criticize them than uh, uh, to propose uh, uh, alternatives. Uh, the markets uh, have a demand for them. Um, so, uh, as, uh, as you can see, I'm not vindicative in any, in any sense. Okay. Ah, sorry, but that, that was only... only, <laughs> only <laughs> then, then there is also the marginal aspect of uh, China uh, and our... Uh, and, and, and their... Uh, yeah, uh, and their uh, competitive position um, well, uh, the, maybe that gentleman does not invest in Europe, many others do. I, I hope that becomes more and more a minority view, including in the Chinese perception of, uh, of Italy, by the way, if possible. Uh, but uh, I, I see some elements, well, some elements seem to me to be a, a caricature of what uh, Europe is, but there are some elements of, of truth. And we don't want to be like, uh, like the Chinese in many respects. I think we have a challenge of finding a market space for Europe's products uh, that uh, allows us, with all the necessary transformations, to keep some features of our society. 
and uh, I am at any rate very skeptical about indefinite uh, extrapolations over time. Uh, um, we all remember, uh, at least a portion of us, uh, the 80s when uh, having the Japanese bought the Rockefeller Center, they were going to buy all of us. Uh, uh, or the oil money after, nine, uh, after 73 or 79. So uh, I wish good luck to, to China. I think their good luck is, is important for us all, but uh, there may be inherent economic and social problems in a society of that size uh, that may make an extrapolation into the future as we tend to do rather, uh, rather um, meaningless, but there are many aspects of China which we should try to, to emulate. And John Palmer, the, the, the euro bonds, uh, I think the, the euro bond is a very equivocal uh, terminology. Um, some euro bonds, of course, already uh, exist, and I think the first one was uh, created in 1961 to serve the financial needs of Autostrade in Italy, something like that. So we are always there, <laughs> especially on the debtor side, as it, as it turns out. Uh, but uh, but uh, project bonds are already in in, uh, in several forms in place. New forms of project bonds are being proposed by by the Commission. Uh, I so I entirely share uh, Mr. Palmer's view that uh, uh, euro bonds in various. Uh, natures could uh, serve a very helpful purpose in, in the context of an investment-led uh, um, recovery uh, as to, uh, to the possible use of euro bonds in the context of uh, sovereign debt. Uh, I think uh, uh, there, there will be a place for them structurally in the slightly longer term because I don't see why, having studied somewhat the single market, I don't see why there should be one segment of the single market, the market for government bonds, which should be permanently precluded from reaping uh, uh, the benefits of a massive scale through a single market, uh, by uh, removing, by finding ways to share the risk, uh, ultimately th through greater uh, liquidity and transparency, ultimately also to the benefit of those which today are the, the best graded uh, issuers of, of euro bonds. But uh, I'm afraid this would bring us uh, too far uh, away. Well. <laughs> I know I'm going to disappoint a lot of people by saying what I'm going to say now. Unfortunately, the time schedule of the Prime Minister is extremely tight. So I'm going to say two things to you and then do one thing, and I would ask you all to remain seated uh, during this. First of all, the two things that I want to say. First of all, I've already made the point that you should remain seated. Secondly, I want to, <laughs> secondly, secondly, I want to thank Mario Monti for being with us and for saying what he has said. He, he, there is no point in my repeating the various encomiums which I started this lecture with. The APCO series, of which this is one, is a series which in particular, I think, has a relevance to the European perspectives which Mario has presented to us. Now, the one thing that I have to do, and I hope that this doesn't wound your dignity, is I have to present to you a certificate, and secondly, I have to ask you to wear a cap. Now, <laughs> others have done it before, including Nelson Mandela, and just about everybody, just about everybody of the distinguished uh, previous speakers here, so I'm going to pass you this, which is your certificate, and then I'm going to ask you to take the cap, and if you want to wear it, I'm not going to object. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. This is a, a dignity-enhancing cap, <laughs> and I, I hope it is also symbolic of a soon-to-come uh, cap on interest rate. <laughs> <laughs>